Thank you, everyone. So, can you hear me? I can't yeah. hear myself. It's okay? Yeah. Yep. Great. Okay, so I'm going to give a very brief outline of CSIRO. So, Chris has done a nice job so far. I'll just go into a bit more detail. Then I'll talk about the energy landscape in Australia and why that's important for modelling. I'll go through our modelling and then I'll talk about how I developed um, my two global models. And I'm going to talk about some applications of the modelling if we've got time. So hopefully solar fuels and then I'll talk about wave energy, but yeah, I, I don't know that we're going to have time for that today, unfortunately. So CSRO is a big organisation in Australia, so we've got um, just over 5,000 staff um, at 55 sites spread all around Australia, so we've got a lot of regional areas. So I'm from Newcastle, which is north of Sydney, so that's one of the regional sites. So you can see that it takes about three hours to get here on the train. Um, and we've got research in what's called business units. Um, in different areas that are considered important for Australia's future, so for um, providing wealth to Australia but also for its citizens. So we've got agriculture, health and biosecurity, Data 61. Just yeah, yeah, okay. Yep, so Data 61, which is where we've got a lot of IT work, so energy, that's where I am. Food and nutrition, land and water. So we tend to do a lot of work with land and water in energy because. Um, you know, energy and, and water are associated with, with each other, so you've got a lot of water used in some types of electricity generation and also land, so for mining and things, so land's affected. Um, also biodiversity, that they look at things like that and climate change. Then we've got manufacturing, so manufacturing solar cells, mineral resources and oceans and atmosphere. So we've done work with oceans and atmosphere on wave and ocean energy. So in, I'm in the energy business unit, as I said, and within that I'm in the grids and energy efficiency program. So that's, um, and that's, that's sort of one of the more renewable areas. So we look at um, the transmission networks around Australia and energy efficiency, as you guessed from the name. So in the energy efficiency domain, we've got things like solar cooling. Um, we look at uh, buildings, so uh, intelligent demand control of buildings, building loads and industrial loads. We also do um, lots of different types of buildings, simulation assessment and communication. So trying to sort of optimise buildings, so reduce energy use, also cost and emissions from buildings. Then within the grids and renewable integration part, we've got our modelling work. So We've got our Australian energy models, which I'm going to talk about. We also do network optimisation and then energy transition pathways, which is the part where we're looking um, from what's happening in the energy space now in Australia and how that's going to move forward into the future. So that's where our modelling work sits as well. And we do work in energy storage, so a lot of that's is battery based. So that's a photo of the energy centre in Newcastle where I'm from. So that's the office wing. So it's actually, it was built in 2002 and at the time, and I'm not sure if it still holds that title, but it was the most efficient building in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, we've got a lot of different types of renewable energy and sort of demonstration facilities on site. So we host the Australian photovoltaic photovoltaic outdoor testing facility so we can test different types of PV arrays so that's photovoltaics like this, the ones you see on households so we can test those different types side by side under the same conditions and monitor you know are, is the efficiency as the manufacturers are saying so that's the kind of thing we're doing with that then we've got our solar thermal um, facility so we've got two solar thermal fields so um, down the bottom, I'll just try and use the pointer. So down here, so that's our second field. So we've got the tower and then the heliostats. So those focus the light up to the tower. And, we, and it's not running all the time. It's actually an experimental field. So we can do various experiments, you know, trying to get high temperatures, look at different types of solar thermal storage, that sort of thing. Then we've got our national HVAC, so that's heating, ventilation, air conditioning, performance facility. So that's where we can actually test 
commercial air conditioners. So we'll do like testing where we'll take in commercial air conditioners and actually check the claims that they're making about the efficiency, how much energy that they're using, things like that. Then we've also got the re renewable en energy integration facility. And that's where we've, we take in all the different types of generation that are on site. So on site, we've got um, different types of photovoltaics pointing in different directions. We've got gas turbines generating heat and power because that's the more efficient way to actually use gas. So we use the heat from the gas turbines to heat and power our building. We've got a wind turbine and different loads. So we, we're looking and oh, sorry, and different types of battery storage. So what we're doing in that renewable energy integration facility is trying to, is trying to look at how can we optimise the system by, by using our site as a model of like the sort of wider grid in Australia and, and different households and things. So that's a brief intro of CSIRO and what we do in energy. So now I'm going to talk about energy in Australia and how and, and the sort of bits of that are relevant for the modelling work which I'm going to talk about. So this is a diagram showing energy flows in Australia. So on the left hand side you've got energy produced. So you can see a lot of it's fossil fuels. So you've got liquefied petroleum gas, natural gas, crude oil, uranium, and then coal and coke and renewables. And some of it's used in Australia. So this is like final energy consumption in Australia. But what's interesting is the amount that actually gets exported. It's huge. So more gets exported than actually used in Australia. And the majority of that is, is coal, all uranium gets exported and then there's sort of natural gas is actually ramping up. So, um, so, that's, that's, so the reason I'm showing this is because a lot of what we do is also about trying to look at how can we continue to export energy into the future but not as fossil fuels. So a lot of the work that we're focused on doing, um, not just in the modelling but within CSIRO itself, is how, we, how can we can continue to export energy to other parts of the world, like Japan, so they're our major buyer of fossil fuels or energy. So how can we continue those exports into the future as, as renewable energy? So how can we export renewable energy? So that's one thing. Then Australia also has a quite a unique electricity network. Um, so we've got it's actually, it's, it's a really long skinny grid. It's not that highly interconnected compared to other countries like the USA um, where, you know, you sort of got the, the populations more spread throughout the country so the electricity network's more connected so it's stronger. In Australia it's a long skinny grid so it's not, you know, it, it sort of has some inherent st instability in it. And so, and it also isn't connected between the west and the east coast so you've got what's called the national energy market, which is the east coast from Queensland around to South Australia and Tasmania. So that's all connected. But then you've got two isolated networks in WA. And you've got smaller networks, so Darwin... Oh, I can't even get to it. Oops. Sorry. Yeah, so Darwin so you, and, and Mount Isa. So you've also got a lot of off-grid, you know, remote powered sites around Australia. So that's important because what we're trying to do to make, to make the grid more stable is actually distribute your electricity generation around that, that long skinny grid. So if you can actually put generation all around it, so distributed generation, so like up here, 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 you know, instead of having, you know, really concentrated coal-fired power stations actually try and distribute your generation then it makes the grid more stable and you're generating electricity close to where it's being used as well. So we're looking at a lot of um, distributed generation technologies. So rooftop photovoltaics is a really good example of that and Australia has one of the, well South Australia in particular has one of the highest rates of penetration of that in the world. Uh, given that we've got all this renewable energy, we, our electricity generation is still highly dominated by coal. So that's a real challenge for us. So you can see that the big light blue square, uh, sorry, 
half circle, that's black coal, so that's what we have in New South Wales and Queensland. Then we've got brown coal, which is in Victoria, natural gas, which is kind of all everywhere. Then we've got hydro and wind and some other small amounts of renewables. So what we want to do is that this is what we're stuck with now. We want to see how can we transition that into the future and you know, to go to a zero emission or low emission system. So we have to replace that coal fired generation with something that's renewable. So this is Australia's greenhouse gas emission reduction target. So this is some work that we did. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about it later as well, but some work we did for the government where we looked, we, we did a, what's called a low emission technology roadmap. And we looked at how can Australia meet its Paris climate target. So we did some modelling around that. So at the moment, well, sorry, going back 2005. So these were our emissions. So, and it's in megatons of CO2. So in total, 595 million tons of CO2 in 2005. So a lot of that was from electricity, 197. You've also got direct combustion, which is where you're sort of using directly combusting gas in industry, transport, and then fugitive emissions. So that's like emissions from coal mines or gas that you can't capture, you can't sort of do anything with it. Um, 2015, there was a reduction, mainly due to some land use changes. But this is where we have to get to in 2030. So to 429 to 440, so a 26 to 28 per cent reduction from 2005 levels. So it's quite a significant challenge given that we've only got, what is it now, 13 years to get there. So we've got to, we've got to turn our system around to actually hit that target. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that after I talk about the modelling. So now I'll go through modelling and how I've developed the models that we use for projecting our capital cost, um, capital cost of electricity generation technologies. So this is uh, um, an, an overview of our modelling suite in our energy economics modelling team. So we're a team of um, five people, and um, it's, it's only quite small, but this is our modelling suite. There's other models in CSIRO, which I'll, I'll, I'll show you later, that we're linking with. So at the top, we've got the um, GALM, which is the global and local learning model. So that's the model I've developed. So there's one for electricity and one for transport, which I'm going to talk about. Then we've got the, and it, these are, so that's global. This is our Australian model. So we've got our global model providing costs to our Australian models. So this is our main Australian model. It's called the energy sector model, and it's a model of electricity and transport in Australia. So it's projecting electricity and transport technologies and uptake and costs from now to 2050. We've also got an electricity demand model, a distribution system model, and putting all that together, then we can look at impact on customers. So we'll get, so not all our funding comes from government, so 40% 40, yeah, 40 of our funding comes from government. So the rest of the 60% we have to go out and get from like industry and do work for industry or get research grants and things. So we do a lot of work for industry or the government and that's they're our customers. Okay, so sorry, I'll just go back a step. So yeah, so what I'm gonna talk about now is developing the global and local learning model. So that model projects the capital cost and uptake of electricity generation technologies globally from now to the year 2050. And the reason why we do that is because most, so, so we feed those costs into the Australian model. The reason why we do that is because most of the technologies for electricity generation used in Australia come from overseas. So that's why we've developed a global model to get the cost because that's what the Australians are paying to actually get these technologies into Australia. So the model is based on this concept called technology learning. So I don't know if you've heard of this. I hadn't heard of it until I actually started working in CSIRO um, nine years ago. Um, so it's, it's a phenomenon that was actually observed back in the 1930s by a guy called Wright 
when he was looking at aeroplane construction and he found that the cost of aeroplane construction, so building aeroplanes, reduced by a certain percentage as they built more aeroplanes. So in this case, I'm showing it for wind, Danish wind turbines. So you can see that as sales increase, the price per turbine comes down. When you plot it on a log-log scale, you've got this straight line and it comes down by a percentage, which is 4%. So that was from 1982 to 1997. So this, so this concept where the cost comes down as you build or learn more, it's called learning, that um, has been observed across many different technologies. So not just wind and not just aeroplanes, but photovoltaics, um, all, all sorts of different electricity generation technologies. So the formula for that, Oh, sorry. So, so what we've done is we've, if we've, we've calculated these curves. So they're based on historical data. So we've calculated these curves and developed them for all the different electricity generation technologies that we're using in our modelling. So we've got one for wind, we've got one for photovoltaics, we've got one for concentrating solar thermal, gas turbines, etc. So um, that's sort of the core part of our electricity model because we want to understand the future cost and uptake. So this, these curves allow you to do that. So that's the formula. So that's where you've got the future investment cost equals the cost at zero time or like the first unit times the um, cumulative capacity in, at the future time divided by the initial capacity, which may just be one if it's the first unit, to the um, minus b. And you can get minus b from this, taking the log of this, where you know the learning rate. So, um, so and, and what's interesting is that um, they found, so this is from a paper by a guy called Grubloff from 1999. So when I first started in CSRO, this was the first paper that I read. And this paper goes through um, energy technologies and learning and global change. So it, and what these guys found, they, they plotted out all of this, this sort of data and they calculated historical learning rates. And what's interesting is that they found for, in the early stages of development of a technology, so this was like back in 1958 for gas turbines. So in the R&D and technical demonstration phases, you've got a really high learning rate of 20%. But as the technology matures and gets more commercial and becomes commercial, the learning rate reduces to 10%. And then when something's mature, it's basically got no learning rate. So the cost isn't changing as you build more of it. So we've taken that idea and used it in our model because there's quite a few emerging, you know, early learning technologies out there that we wanted to build into our model so we could project their uptake and cost into the future because those technologies, they might not be ready now, but they could be ready in the future. So something like carbon capture and storage, that's where you're taking the carbon dioxide from power stations and sequestering it in the ground. So there's a lot of research going on in that area, but it's not a commercial technology yet. It's still in this R&D phase. So we wanted to build that into our model because it's considered to be an important technology for countries that will have difficulty decarbonising and don't have a lot of renewable resources. So th this is the kind of thing that we've built into our model. I'll just, uh, th uh, this is a bit of a side, but it's, it's could have, sort of interesting. So they also looked at technology diffusion, and I just really like this figure showing how you can see, I don't even know how they got the data, horses from 1850 a lot of them, a lot of them, and they just started declining as cars came along. And then cars sort of took over from horses, you know, sometime in the 1920s. So, um, and, the, and you can see these transitions for electricity generation of technologies as well. It's just not as, that's much more subtle. This is pretty um, unsubtle. So um, this is our protocol for doing our electricity generation projections. So we've got the learning curves, which I've talked about. Then we've got our global electricity model. So I'm not really, there is a transport model, but I'm not really going to talk about that. I'll focus on electricity. So in that model, we've got electricity demand, which we get from other sources. So we don't develop that. Demand's driving the technology uptake and the cost. So we take that from outside. We've got 13 regions. 
um, and 20 technologies is a bit more now, but it was 20. We take in climate policies like um, the Paris Agreement, carbon pricing. Then we've got resource data such as um, renewable resources in, different, in the different regions. And we take in costs from outside as well, such as operating and maintenance costs for um, the technologies and also coal prices, gas prices, oil prices. So we put all that together in, a, in our global modelling framework. We've got our learning curves and what we can calculate then are the technology costs and uptake, which we then feed into our Australian model at the state level. The reason why we don't use this model for Australia is because um, it's not as detailed as this model. So you know, this has got all the Australian policies at the state level. It's quite detailed, whereas ours is a bit, because it's global, it's not as detailed. So I'm going to talk about the learning curve development that we did in the modelling for wind. So we've seen that the learning curve says as we build more, the cost tends to decrease, but it doesn't always happen. So you've got things which are called compound effects. So that's where you've got a technology is made up of different components. It's not just like one thing, it's actually got different components. And the different components can have different learning rates or they can be developed in different regions. So wind, for example, you've got wind turbines which are developed globally, but you've got the installation happens locally. So it's important to separate out those effects. Then market forces can result in price increases and in what's called a price bubble. So we have seen price bubbles for wind and for photovoltaics. And government policy and R&D spending can also have an influence on the cost of technology. So if a technology has a lot of government support, that's going to help push build it. So it's going to help push it down the learning curve. So I'm going to show an example here of wind turbines, which demonstrates the compound effect and the price bubble. So this is data for Europe. So it's dollars, so it's euros per kilowatt. Um, and you've got the turbine price and the installation price. And you can see that in 2005, the price of turbines started increasing. And in 2004, the installation price started increasing. Now the reasons for, and that's opposite to what learning curve is saying. So it's saying the price comes down over time, which you can see, sorry, over with increasing installations. And you can see that was what was happening here before it started going up. Now, the reason for that is there were policies at the time in Europe which were promoting a lot of um, wind energy and there was a um, supply shortfall. So a lot of demand, limited supply, that pushed the price up. And um, there, it was over and above what it should have been as well because there was a lot of profiteering going on. So uh, um, some analysis has found that like 80% of the price increase was due to profiteering, which they could do because it was such a high demand. So what do you do about that? Like that's, uh, so you have to try and build that into modelling, which is what we've done. So these are ways for actually addressing that. Um, so we know now it was a bubble. At the time when it was happening, people weren't sure. And what they were doing was actually forecasting the price off the top and overestimating the future projected price of those technologies. Um, so what our approach has been to determine the bubble and, and forecast future bubbles as well. So going back to wind again, so you can see I've put on there what the learning curve or experience, that's another name for experience curve. So where that sits and you've got that price increase. So our way of dealing with that price increase is to come up with what we call penalty constraint. So it's basically where if you build much, too much in any year in the modelling of one technology, which in this case is wind, but it's for every technology, the price of that technology increases and we base that increase on what happened with wind. And the impact of that price increase is that the model, instead of paying more, it can, but if, if it doesn't want to, you know, it will then go and build another technology instead. So you tend to get 
a, a broader range of technologies coming up in the modelling instead of just like one dominant technology. So this is the effect it has on capital cost, so the dollars per kilowatt cost of wind. So with the penalty on, the price goes up, but then it's a bubble. So the bubble bursts, the price comes back down. Whereas if you don't have that penalty, the price is always low. And it also has an effect on uptake of the technology. So this is the installed capacity, sorry, new capacity installed each year. So with the penalty, you get a bump because they're paying the penalty, they're installing a lot, but then it, it gradually sort of flattens out and you just get a steady increase over time. Whereas if you, without the penalty, it's a bit boom and bust. So you've got a lot installed, nothing, you know, a tiny bit, massive amount and then nothing. And you know, that, that's sort of not how an industry can operate. It can't have this boom and bust type of thing. You know, if, if there was no wind being installed for this long, the industry would die. So, um, yeah, so having that penalty in the model um, makes things more realistic. So we talked about the compound effects, so that's where the learning's coming from, market forces, now government policy and R&D spending. So as I said, that's where you've got inclusion of carbon prices. So what we can do is model different carbon prices in our modelling to get different scenarios. So we can model a low price, look at what the impact is of that on, on the uptake, model a high price, look at what the impact is of that. For Australia, we've got the renewable energy target, and then we've got different country policies. So we've got feed-in tariffs. So Europe, there's also in, in, some in China. Uh, sorry, Japan. We've got Chinese mandated targets. So where they'll build, they'll say they'll build so much of this technology by this date. So we put those in. Um, we've also got US state-level policies. Um, and we also force deployment of some technologies to represent demonstration projects, so, which is important for emerging technologies to help push them down the learning curve so then they can start to be built and, and see cost reductions themselves. So an example of that is, is carbon capture and storage, ocean energy, um, and some types of geothermal. So this is just a summary of the model. So, um, as I've said, global and local, it projects global and local electricity technology costs using learning curves. So it's, it's a mixed integer linear program solved in GAMS, which is um, the general algebraic modeling system. So this is the, it's, it's a programming language that's it's used mainly by economists. So, um, and we solve it out to 2095, the year 2095 in annual time steps, and we've got 13 regions. So the mixed integer part is, is actually the sort of um, key part of the model. So what, what we do is with the learning curves, I'll just show you this so it's an answer. So we break it up into segments, and then we have the integer part is which segment you're in. So it's, as if, it's a zero if you're not in that segment, it's a one if you're in a segment. So, and that's what we're solving, that's the core part of the model. We've got 20 centralised and 30 on-site generation technologies and also so battery storage, I've, I've built that in the model now, and transport sector has been developed as well. It's um, a lot bigger, it takes a lot longer to solve because uh, there's more technologies in transport, so you know you don't just have fuel conversion technologies. Of what you've also got all the different vehicle types. You've got electric vehicles, fuel cell vehicles. You've got air travel. You've got it, it's it's a much sort of bigger model, and it takes a lot longer to solve. So at the moment, it takes seven hours, whereas the electricity model can take about 45 minutes. I'll just I'll skip over that. So this is. This is some results. So this is, it's not the complete technology set, but this, these are some results we actually did for, we generated these for the government a couple of years ago. So um, these are the projected capital costs. So I'll just point out a few things. So concentrating solar thermal, which is, it's been around for a while, but it's still considered an emerging technology. Like there's not 
while there's some there's been some developments in Spain and the US, it's still considered emerging. So we see it's got a higher learning rate, so it has rapid cost reductions as it gets deployed, but then it hits a lower limit, which is based on the materials cost. So you can't actually go below the materials cost of a technology. So um, that's a lower limit for that technology. Then we've got photovoltaics, which also have cost reductions continuing over time. And this is an example of the uptake. So this, this is electricity generation. So this, this matches those costs that I just showed you. So these, these wedges show how much electricity is generated by a technology. So, at, so we, we normally show out to 2050, not out to 2095, because you can have end effects. So we run the model out that far to stop end effects. So um, you can see that a lot of black coal generation this is under a 550 parts per million carbon price scenario, so that's a two degrees world. So black coal generation sort of basically dies by 2035, and, it's, and then you get a build-up of carbon capture and storage with black coal. A lot of gas generation, that's here. Nuclear, so it's kind of, you get a bit of an expansion because it is zero emission. Then we see a fair chunk of concentrating solar thermal, rooftop photovoltaics, and large scale photovoltaics, then wind. Wind gets pushed out a bit by the solar because the solar just gets so much cheaper. Then hydro is kind of constant, um, a bit of ocean energy, and then, con and then this combined heat and power. So this is where, as we've got in, on our, at our energy centre, it's where you're using gas and you're generating heat and power at the same time, so it's quite efficient. So if we don't have a carbon price, this looks quite different. So if we didn't have a carbon price, you would basically see this continuing into the future. So... Um, this is going back to what I was uh, talking about earlier about the Paris um, climate target. So we did some modelling where we looked at um, how can Australia hit those climate targets? Now, what are some pathways to get there? So we looked at four different pathways, which are listed there. Um, if you want to be two, P3, P4. Um, and we looked at how can we actually um, reduce emissions to hit those targets. And what we found is that most of the, heav the sort of heavy action has to come from electricity because it's actually easier to reduce e emissions in electricity than in other sectors like transport um, and direct combustion. So we found that under all these different pathways, which had different aspects. So this one was focused on energy efficiency. Um, so uh, trying to make industry and buildings more efficient. This one was focused on photovoltaics and wind. This one on photovoltaics, wind, but also other technologies su such as concentrating solar power. And this was everything. And you can see that electricity, so that's here, 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 here. We have to reduce our emissions from electricity by at least 52%. And the other sectors have to do their share as well to hit the Paris climate targets in 2030. And it's a really big ask to get there um, in 13 years. But that's, that's what we have to do. We also looked at out to 2050. And um, even though there's no policy out that far, we, we just continued the modelling and said, OK, what could we actually technically do? And so we found that electricity could actually get its emissions down so that's only 10. So it's a huge reduction from these levels down to just 10. So that was really basically transforming the electricity sector to being practically zero emissions. So you've basically got a little bit of gas generating those emissions. So you've got photovoltaics, wind, replacing pretty much everything.
So um, this is so that, that was work we did last year for the government. Um, this is what we're trying to do at the moment. It's called the Australian National Outlook Part Two. So there was a part one, um, which came out a couple of years ago. So this is where we're trying to integrate all the different types of models in CSIRO to look at um, what's going to happen in the, in the future, and not just in energy, but in <coughs> everything. So um, food and land use, well, these are my models, so electricity, transport, sorry, that's global. So in, in Australia, we're looking at impact on water, biodiversity, land use change, economics, so the economy as a whole, energy, material stocks and flows, that's Tim's model. Um, so th this is a big modelling exercise where we're trying to link all these different models together. Um, and so we'll run like one model, take the results, put it in another model, take the results of that, put it back in another model, iterate. It's, um, it's quite an involved process. But by putting all that together, we're allowed to, we, we can look at, um, you know, get a broader idea of what's going to happen in the future under different scenarios. Okay, so I've got time, so great. So I'll talk about this something a bit different. So um, it's an application of the modelling. Um, it's, it's on solar fuels. So renewable energy is normally associated with electricity, which is what I've been talking about. But there is actually a blind spot. So this is uh, energy use in Australia by sector. Where have you gone? Oh, sorry. I didn't realise it had a light in it. So um, we've got this sort of blind spot where a lot of energy is actually used as petroleum products in transport. So I'm not talking about emissions now, it's actually energy use. So we need to do something about this. So not just electricity, but also transport. We've got to do something about transport and liquid fuels because they're heavily used in Australia, diesel in particular. Oh, let's keep that. So this is where this is why we looked at solar fuels. So it's something a little bit different. So um, it's a way to decarbonise fuels in Australia. So um, and Australia's ideally placed to be a world leader in solar fuels because we've got cheap and plentiful, plentiful fossil fuels which, and biomass, which can be used in solar fuels. Um, we've got gas and one of the best solar resources in the world. So that's shown here by the red, so that the higher the red is, the, the better the solar resource is. So there are many options to getting solar fuels. So that's so solar fuels is where you're making a fuel with a solar component. Um, so th these are the main types that we're looking at in CSIRO, and these are the sort of more technology-ready processes. So you've got solar methane reforming. So that's where you've got natural gas, and you're solarising that natural gas. So you're reducing the emissions from the fuel by, by using solar, solar cracking, and then solar gasification, which is where you're gasifying biomass or coal to make a fuel. So again, by using the solar component, you're reducing the emissions from that process. There's also water and CO2 splitting, which are fantastic, but they're more of a long-term goal. And the solar fuels can be hydrogen, syngas, which is a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and from that you can make any type of fuel, and also liquid fuels. So in order to make the solar fuels, you need a solar tower and a field. So this is showing, this is what we have in Newcastle. So it's the two solar fields, um, solar towers and the two solar fields. So this is where the sun hits these, uh, 
mirrors called heliostats and the light is focused up here to at the top of the tower where you've got what's called the receiver where the reaction takes place so that's where you're making the fuel so this is the more technology ready case so solar reforming so this is where so that's an example of our reactor in Newcastle on the smaller solar field so that's where you take in methane and steam and convert it to carbon monoxide and hydrogen which is called syngas so you're using the solar energy to actually do this reaction and as I said from syngas you can do other reactions to make different types of fuels um, so there's a, pro, a pilot scale plant for hydrogen production and it is the most mature technology of the solar fuels options then we've got coal or biomass gasification using solar so that's where you've got carbon not methane going in with steam and you're making syngas again so this is more challenging because you've got it, it doesn't actually so what happens is you put the bio, biomass or coal into the reactor heat it up it gasifies so it makes it into a gas but then you've, it doesn't convert everything to a gas you've got this sort of solid mass left at the bottom of the reactor and it's it's a challenge because you can't then turn it into a continuous process where you put in your biomass irradiate it make syngas it's, it can't be continuous because you've got this thing that you have to clean out left at the bottom so you either have to um, clean it out so do the reaction get the syngas clean out the carbon or put another reactor up there so it's, it's more of a batch process so and that's um, challenging because you can't run for a long time it's harder technically to do um, people are looking at ways around it but it is more challenging but the advantage is if you use biomass zero emission or you can use brown coal which is what they have in Victoria it's incredibly cheap um, the brown coal fired power stations are gradually closing they're very old so Hazelwood closed that was from the 1960s um, they're looking for new markets for brown coal so this is a way to actually reduce the emissions from that um, and you can also sequester the CO2 from this process if you use brown coal which is great because then you've got a low carbon energy product mm. okay. now this is the most challenging but it's it's the sort of holy grail of all the solar fuels work so that's water and CO2 splitting. So um, just taking water, splitting it into hydrogen and oxygen. So 100% solar, 100% reduction CO2 has been proven at small scales in labs. It's it's very challenging because you need a really high temperature. They're trying to, and there's the, the materials aren't available at the moment to actually do this. So the materials that to go into the receivers aren't available. They're looking at uh, different processes to, to sort of facilitate this, but it's, it's proving difficult. It is an active area of research, but it's a real holy grail because you can imagine you could actually extract CO2 from the atmosphere, add water to it, split it, then you can make the syngas, the carbon monoxide hydrogen, make your fuel, put it into your vehicle, emit CO2, then it absorbs the CO2 again. So it becomes like a closed loop cycle. And you're using solar to actually make the fuel and nothing else. So that's what people are working towards, but it, it is uh, a long way off. Uh, I might just skip. So, as, so that was a project where we looked at the technical challenges of solar fuels, but also we, we tried to project the cost so that was that was my part of the work um, project the cost of the solar fuels and um, it was quite complex because there are a lot of processes involved so there's a lot of research going on in this area a lot of different types of reactors different size solar fields 
um, different feeds, different fuels you can make. Um, so we, we tried to look at all of that and come up with like the best solutions um, for Australia. And we were also looking at, if you recall, at the start I showed you that energy diagram where we've got the majority of energy going out of Australia being exported. So for this we were looking, we had sort of a focus on how can we um, continue to export energy but make it low emission. So we focused on Japan, where Japan has a lot of policies on hydrogen. So we looked at how can we make, so, so we looked at uh, solar fuels with a focus on making hydrogen. But for Australia, it's, most, it's more sensible to talk about making liquid fuels like diesel because we use a lot of diesel here. We import most of our oil and fuels. Um, we also looked at making methanol and ammonia. So we found the prices. So we calculated the prices. So this is, these are the prices per litre. So it's just the, the cost of making the fuel. So this is oil, like what we have now. I mean, it's not $100 a barrel. So when we were doing this, it was a high oil price. It's much lower now, but that's 56 cents a litre. And we could make solar fuels if we can scale up the technology, make it commercial. So we were looking at year 2020. So again, using that technology learning, we looked at if we built it, we'll get the cost down. How much do we have to build to make it commercial? Okay, this will be the commercial price in the future. So this is what we could get the cost down to, which is lower than oil. And that's from these three different processes. So gasification of brown coal, gasification of biomass, and steam, steam, uh, sorry, steam methane reforming. So I'll talk a little bit now about Japan because it's um, that that was that was something that came out of this work um, that was quite interesting. So um, Japan has a, a an energy strategy where they want to demonstrate a hydrogen economy at the 2020 Olympics. So they're ramping up um, the number of fuel cell vehicles on the road which run off hydrogen. They're ramping up hydrogen refueling stations. And they're also doing a lot of research into um, uh, gas turbines, converting gas turbines into running off hydrogen or ammonia, which is actually a hydrogen carrier. So, um, and they want to move away from nuclear. So, um, the reason that they've picked hydrogen is because, well, they're, they're, a, sort of, they're an, a net energy importer. Hydrogen is zero emission and um, you can actually get it, they could make it themselves, but also import it from lots of different countries. Um, so one example of that is Kawasaki. So they've actually got a project in Victoria where they're looking at gasifying the brown coal, which I talked about, which is this really cheap type of coal, gasifying that. So this isn't solar, unfortunately, but it could be a solar process. So gasifying it, sequestering the emissions because it, is, because it is quite emissions intensive. So sequestering the emissions using carbon capture and storage, making liquid hydrogen, transporting it using tankers which don't actually exist yet. So the technology is not there to actually make these tankers, but they're working on it. Transport them to Japan where they then offload the hydrogen and use it for transport or electricity generation. There's also Chiyoda Corporation's got another method where they're looking at transporting methyl cyclohexane. So that's got, a, you know, it's got hydrogens on it. Take the hydrogens off, send the ships back full of toluene, put the hydrogens on the toluene, make methyl cyclohexane transport Japan. So that, that's another, another way of doing it. There are, another company is also looking at ammonia. So um, and ammonia is a quite a good carrier because it's easier to make. The ships are currently available and it's, it's actually a commodity that's shipped around the world now, not as much as it would be using this. It tends to be made and used locally, but um, yeah, it, could, it could be done in Australia. And as part of this work, we actually looked at how could you do a solar fuel process using steam methane reforming in Queensland, so at Gladstone, 
which is where um, in Queensland, where a lot of our liquefied natural gas is sent to Japan now, could we take a stream of that gas, convert it into a solar fuel, so make hydrogen, sorry, make ammonia and ship that to Japan? So we did the economics of that and um, it looks quite favourable. But we're a long way from that. So how are we going to get there? So, and that was part of the work that we did as well. We wanted to look at what do we need to do, what does Australia need to do to actually get there? So we're at pilot scale now. So we have produced fuels. We've got the materials up to 900 degrees. Whoops. We need to move to demonstration scale. So that's something that we'd love to see happen up in Queensland, where you can demonstrate this happening at a larger capacity. So going from 600 kilowatts up to five to 10 megawatts and a thousand hours of operation, which is quite significant. So again, this is all the steam, methane reforming, which is the most mature technology. Then a pre-commercial plant would be the next step demonstrating 5,000 hours of operation, bigger capacity, and then from that you can step to a commercial plant. So 25 to 50 megawatts and for solar fuels companies. So 10 years, I mean, it's pretty optimistic, but that's, you know, it's something that we would love to see anyway. Okay, so that's, I was going to move on to wave energy, but do you think I should stop? It kind of depends. We do need to we need to wrap up and be out of here for the five thirty. So it's a choice now between having more time with your questions on what we've seen so far, or less time but some information about wave energy. Can we put it to to the, the vote of the yep. audience? What do you think? If you think it should be time for question and answer, then raise your hand vocally and loudly and, and you're very high up in here. What do you think? Question and answer? Ooh. Mm, okay. Everyone's a bit tired. <laughs> Wave energy? Oh, okay. okay. All right. Wave energy. All right. All right. All right. Okay. So it's another shift in direction. This, this, and, but again, it's an application of our modelling. So why wave energy? It's an emerging technology. It was missing from projections, so we've put it into our models. Um, it's got a lot of advantages. So it's zero emission. Australia has a really large resource along the southern coastline of wave energy. It has potential to be low cost. 80% um, of our population lives on the coast, so it's near where the generation happens, um, which helps with our long skinny networks, as I was saying at the beginning. It's, it's, very, it's, it's easier to estimate than other forms of renewable generation, so its output can be estimated three days in advance, unlike wind or solar. And it may have a base load component, so that's where it's generating some amount of electricity all the time, whereas photovoltaics doesn't, doesn't generate at night. So what is it? So it's harnessing the power of the waves. There are about 200 different designs out there. And, but they're split into three different classes, point absorber, linear attenuator, and terminator. So an example, this is an example of how a point absorber works. So you've got generators sitting on the ocean floor. You've got this buoy, which is tethered to that generator. The wave comes along and it pushes the buoy up and down. And so that up and down motion is shifted to the generator and that's how you convert it. So you're taking that energy and making electricity from it. So some designs, it's not showing there. Some designs actually have a working fluid. So um, this, this sort of up and down motion pumps a liquid, which can then be put through a turbine and used to generate electricity. So there's an Australian design, it's called the, um, it's, it's by Carnegie, I've forgotten the name of it, it's by Carnegie Corporation and there are three uh, wave energy converters off the coast of Perth which use that technology. So they're pumping a working fluid and they're running that through a turbine to generate electricity. 
So this is an, this is an example of a um, test rig in Sweden. So unfortunately, I don't have a photo of the one in Perth, but I've got one of this one in Sweden, which is similar. So again, you've got the boy. This one's working. Um, it's, it's just generating electricity in, in this system here. Um, Then um, the second type is a terminator. So that's where you've got, so it basically stops the waves. So the other one sort of works, works more with the waves and it can accept waves from any direction because it's, a, it's just a point. So if the wave comes that way, the thing's still gonna bob up and down. Whereas this one, you've got to align it so that the wave is flowing into this tapered channel and you've got a generator at the end of the tapered channel. So you're collecting the waves, you're collecting the water, and then you're using that to generate electricity. So these tend to be bigger structures. So this is an example of one called the Wave Dragon, which um, this again is one in Scandinavia. So this is where you've got these big arms. The wave comes in, so it, it goes up this, this sort of ramp, goes into this thing, which is the reservoir. And then the, way, the water flows out through a turbine, like a hydroelectric turbine, and you can generate electricity that way. So they were planning quite a few installations um, in a way from Portugal, but uh, yeah, that, sort of, that hasn't happened, unfortunately. Then the, other, the third type is a linear attenuator. So that's where you've got it's got these joints and so the wave flows along and as the wave flows the joints move you know, closer and then further apart and so that motion um, is pumping a fluid and that's used to generate electricity. So an example of that is the Palamas. So this was a Scottish technology and it was deployed off the coast of Portugal but unfortunately the company went bust so they had to bring them in, but um, it, you can see it's sort of like this long snake thing. So the wave comes along and, this, and the joints move and this thing bobs up and then the joints move and it, it pumps a working fluid to generate electricity. Now it's, a, it's sort of an older design. So people are considering the point absorber, which is the first one I talked about as the most, uh, the cheapest um, and probably the safest. Um, as well, because the problem is the ocean can be a very um, harsh environment and if you've got something that's floating on top of the water, it's actually going to be hit by waves and, you know, actually, it, it, you know, if there's storms that can actually be impacted more than something which sits below the surface, which the point absorber does. So the resource along the southern ocean of Australia is, is really high. It's one of the highest in the world. So it has this coat, so, it's, so the darker colour, sorry, the redder colours are where the resource is strongest. So this um, west coast of Tasmania has the highest resource. Victoria has a really good resource. Southern part of Western Australia and then around Kangaroo Island as well. So it's not like New South Wales doesn't have a good resource. It's really this Southern Ocean. So um, the methodology that we used in this work, so what we were trying to do was project the future uptake of wave energy in Australia. So we took in resource information. So we had people from Oceans and Atmosphere in CSIRO do that for us. They calculated this resource here. They looked at it all around the coastline. We took the technology information. So there, at the time we had the performance specification of three different wave energy converters, so one of each type. Then we were able to calculate the energy and power output per region, per device, and then we fed that information into our electricity models. So, um, 
Oh, that, that's the way of energy flux. So that's the kilowatts of energy per metre, which is it's, it's like what I've just already showed you. You take that information, the significant wave height and the peak wave period, and using that information in this, this is the performance curve of a wave energy converter. You can then calculate how much energy it's going to produce based on this information height and period. And so we could then take that, um, calculate the energy generation and then plug that into our Australian model, the energy sector model. And then we can look at how does wave energy compare with other technologies. Oh, so they were the regions that we used. So we did, while there's not a great resource, we still looked at Queensland because there is a high population up there and you know, it might be competitive with other forms of generation. So we used um, the model I've talked about, so the global model. So we used the global model to project the cost of the wave energy technologies. And then we used our energy sector model to um, project the uptake in Australia of wave energy. So this is a global result. So we found that um, wave energy could produce up to 2% of global electricity generation. So globally, the resource, it, it's, it's not as strong as solar or wind because it's concentrated in a few regions like parts of Europe have a really strong wave resource. Um, Southern South Africa um, has it and Australia and parts of um, South America. So Chile also has a good resource and Canada. So when we look at Australia, so 2% globally, when we do the same carbon price part in Australia using the point absorber, which is the more mature technology and the more lower cost, we found that we could actually um, meet 10% of Australia's electricity demand from wave energy, which is, is quite high. And most of that was in Tasmania and Victoria, where we have the really strong resource. So what we were finding is that the brown coal fired power stations were actually switching to wave energy. So we were losing some of those. So we also looked at, so um, the, you know, other people use the oceans as well, so you can't just put wave energy wherever you want. So what's the acceptance of that? So there's a lot of indigenous land and native title and land rights around the coastline. You've got marine protected areas. You've also got industries, fishing, aquaculture, oil, gas and mineral exploration, shipping, so navy, so security and tourism and visual amenity. So it's interesting. So when we were doing this work, we actually, someone found out about it and it was a guy who was a um, lobster farmer down in South Australia and he rang up and he was complaining about it even though we hadn't actually done anything. So um, yeah, it, it, can, it can be contentious and you know, if you want to do something like this, it needs to be handled correctly and you, know, you need to involve all the stakeholders and do a lot of engagement to actually try and do this, this technology. So we looked also at how would you actually configure wave farms um, because we've got a huge coastline. How are you going to configure them around the coastline? So um, this is an example of the point absorber again. So, and you have to also lay them out so that they don't interfere with each other because you don't have, want to have one exactly behind the other because then the first one takes all the way of energy. There's nothing left for the next one. So you've got to space them appropriately so um, they're not interfering, but also, and they don't sort of bang into each other, so that they would be moored but on um, a tether so that they can rotate with the, to meet the waves. And you can't extract all of the energy. So um, for um, to preserve the ocean floor and for um, animals living on the ocean floor, um, we found that you could only extract 20% um, of incoming wave energy. 
So that was a constraint in the modelling that we were doing. Okay. So we found that wave energy has the potential to make a significant contribution to electricity generation. Um, and we found that Victoria had a majority of wave farms because you've got a strong resource, large population, and also emissions intensive generation. But we need to understand impact on the environment, other industries there, and um, design construction and maintaining a wave farm. So we need to deploy devices, which has, as I said, has happened off the coast of Perth. And that's it. Thank you.